So folks are gonna be uh, streaming in. Thank you for coming. Um, I wanna introduce myself and introduce you to Richard Rockman in a, in a second, but as folks are coming in, um, I wanted to also just introduce uh, the Institute for Sustainability for those of you who are uh, first to first um, time joining us. Um, we're uh, a center located at, uh, at the campus of Cal State University of Northridge. Uh, we've been around since 2008 and our, um, we work, work closely with um, several other centers, um, associated students, um, facilities and planning on, on um, delivering or instituting uh, sustainability principles and sustainability infrastructure and um, working to create a sustainable campus and a sustainable CSU. And uh, the Institute in particular focuses on education and curriculum and working with um, our students on research, uh, pedagogical methods, uh, providing volunteer and service learning opportunities. And, um, and also hosting these webinars. So we've been doing these for a while. Uh, we really ramped them up um, in th uh, during Earth Month, uh, working with associated students. And now we're also, and hence uh, Outdoor Adventures. Thank you for helping host this uh, event, Chris. And so we're gonna be doing these, these um, ongoing webinars uh, through the summer. And we're now, we've been pivoting towards our very own matadors, folks who have, um, who have uh, graduated from CSU, uh, from CSUN and also have um, benefited and also have um, utilized and enhanced our uh, campus food garden, which has been around for, for almost a decade now. And with that, I wanted to, um, to introduce you. Uh, it's a great honor to have our uh, very own Richard Rockman here, who is a, uh, a Matador alum who graduated in uh, last year, correct, Richard? Uh, 2020 or 2019. Yeah, my bachelor's, my bachelor's okay. last year. And, yeah. and now, and now, Richard is a graduate student in the biology department who is a has this incredible um, Instagram page. So make sure you um, you'll hopefully you'll promote it um, called the Wandering Ecologist, which is uh, provides a, a really an amazing um, uh, service to Los Angeles and to folks who are interested in urban ecology and thinking about biodiversity. And so Richard has been uh, documenting, um, as he'll talk about today, uh, some of the biodiversity in our CSUN uh, food garden. Many of you are probably familiar uh, with it and have been there. And Richard, uh, as a student, also utilized uh, and worked in the, in the campus food garden. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about that. And he's been um, working with us now, um, as I said, documenting some of this biodiversity. And he's currently right now uh, joining us from uh, Reno, <laughs> and maybe I'll tell you about that. But he's actually working with the uh, is it National Park? Oh, with the BLM. He's working on BLM uh, land. Yeah, the Bureau of Land Management. It's uh, working alongside them as a contractor. It's a little complicated, but yeah. Oh, doing doing research, identification, same kinds of things of biodiversity, um, and maybe he'll talk a little bit about that today. For those of you who haven't been to or are not familiar with that part of Northeast California. It is an incredible, um, uh, beautiful place. Um, but as Richard will tell you about today, so is LA and so is our urban environment. And both these places have wonderful stories and wonderful, wonderful uh, examples of biodiversity that we should always be on the lookout for. So with that, Richard, uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, Richard's going to uh, walk us through a, a um, a PowerPoint presentation, and then after we'll have some question and answers. So, if throughout the presentation you do have any questions, just chat it in there, and and, and Richard and I will actually will get that, and I'll the, the, any of your your chat messages, and um, we'll uh, I'll be able to address them if not during the talk, after the talk. So, so with that, Richard, uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really flattered. Okay, so like this title page says, today we're gonna to talk about exploring urban ecology using citizen science. And I'll talk a little bit more about those def definitions in a bit. So what's gonna be in this presentation? We're going to have the introduction, which is just gonna familiarize yourself with some of the background information. The methods, how I did what I did, the results, uh, and a little bit of the raw data, like what I've found, 
discussion, me kind of analyzing that raw data, and then conclusions, some kind of assumptions I'm making given the data. So, and before I go forward, a lot of what I did was exploratory. This wasn't a flat, uh, fully fleshed out experiment, um, though it kind of has some of those resemblances. I wanted to show this plant that is at the food garden. It's one of my favorite species. This is coyote gourd. And uh, kind of in the corner, you can also see some prickly, uh, prickly lettuce, which will be a big um, contender in this discussion today. Um, I just really love coyote gourd. It was utilized by a lot of indigenous people, dispersed throughout California, and it's just a super cool plant. Okay, so first let's go into the introduction, background information. So here's a little picture of the food garden. You got shrubs, you got fava beans, you got amaranth, you got some mallow, really pretty in the background. What, and what I love about this picture is right in the center at the end of this aisle, if you go down this dirt area, there's a morning dove that's like spreading out its wings and just kind of like soaking in the sun and trying to get rid of some of those ectoparasites that are probably on its skin. Um, so I just love this. It's, it, it gives a really cool snapshot of what the garden looks like. And this is just like a sliver of the garden. So next, what is the Seasun Food Garden and how big is it? So I'll go into a little more of that, but let me show you a map of our campus. So again, I made this little map on the fly of CSUN food, uh, CSUN campus. Um, or I ruined it. There was a scale bar. Yeah, kilometers. That red area, the little smidge in the uh, northeast corner, that's the food garden. The food garden is approximately half an acre, maybe around 2,000 square meters. Um, it's pretty awesome. So a little history, like going back and currently about the uh, CSUN Food Garden and the San Fernando Valley as a whole. The Tongva Nation has lived here for about 7,000 years, and they had a bunch of villages throughout the San Fernando Valley in which they'd move and um, follow plants and animals. The valley was pretty much dominated by things called annual forbs. So I'm gonna use that word forb a lot during this talk. Forb refers to like flowering things. Um, so maybe it could be used for like non-flowering things. Maybe. But forbs are typically seen as flowering plants. And so the soil types in the San Fernando Valley are known as uh, clay soils. They're very hard, um, though they're heavily disturbed, and I'll talk about that. And so you just have these like, kind of grasslands, but not really full of grass, more so forbs, historically speaking. And, and they, these soils were disturbed by ground dwelling rodents, things like um, bodice, pocket gopher, antelope, ground squirrel. Um, California ground squirrel, these sort of animals like dug up the soil, redistributed bulbs and seeds. And then we had grizzly bears, which tons of grizzly bears in the San Fernando Valley. And they coexisted with the Tongva Nation for thousands of years until a lot of the white people wiped them out, um, drove them to extinction. So next, you know, we had clo white colonial occupation. We had the Spaniards that came here. Um, they brought a lot of their ranching and um, their mission system. And though this altered the ecosystem, a lot of the old plants stayed. So we had a lot of new invaders coming from Europe, but we had a lot of old plants as well that persisted in this landscape. So we go into the more of the modern era, into the 20th or late 19th century, early 20th century, and we're having more radical changes in the San Fernando Valley with agriculture and farming and housing. And these sorts of things really changed the landscape of plants and animals to the point where it's almost unrecognizable to what they used to be. So like, um, like Nat said earlier, the Seasun Food Garden's been around for almost a decade. Um, Low-income communities have primarily been the people that have been volunteering at the garden and driving the decision-making processes, which is awesome. When I first came to Seasun in 2016, I was food insecure and I heavily depended upon the food garden. I even spoke about it at a conference in. Uh, 2018 um, and was involved in some research as well about food security, which leads me to that. Uh, so the food garden also donates a lot of their plants and um, their fruits and vegetables to the food tree um, to help students that are food insecure. How many students is this? So approximately 40% of uh, Cal State University students um, in the entire CSU system are food insecure. That's a lot of students. It could be more or less at Cal State Northridge. Um, the research I was a part of didn't quite look into that. And 
what are some of the benefits of the food garden just on like a human scale? It allows students to gain a huge amount of experience. And a lot of times this is a requirement for their classes as well, that they do some sort of volunteer thing. And so students get that opportunity. They learn how to garden. Some of this is the first time, like getting in dirty with dirt and soil and like getting their getting experience with fruits, uh, fruits and vegetables. So next I'm going to talk about some definitions. I'm going to talk about urban ecology, what that is, citizen science, and environmental racism. Uh, and also if you were watching my Instagram takeover, I talked a lot about these things in that as well. So some of this is borrowed from that. So what is uh, urban ecology? Let me move this window so I can actually read it. Um, Urban ecology is the study of the habitats of humans and other organisms, the flow of energy, water, and materials, and the political and cultural ramifications of human choice in the world's towns and cities. I really wanted to emphasize human choice, as a lot of this is implicit or um, decisive. Like we've made these decisions consciously, or some, a lot of times we we just did it by accident. But most of the time, it involves that area of human choice where we could swing things one way or the other with these sorts of habitats. Next, what is citizen science? Citizen science is the utilization of current technology by anyone with means to a camera and the internet to record natural history and scientific phenomena in order to contribute to scientists in the greater compendium of knowledge. So why did I emphasize anyone with needs, means? Um, this is, there's a certain amount of privilege that goes around with doing citizen science. I, I really hope that everyone can reach out and do citizen science, but that comes from a privileged perspective myself as a white person. So I recognize that. And I think some of the means of addressing that could be through financing students to do citizen science with grants, particularly to lower income communities. And finally, um, kind of leeway into that is environmental racism. And due to redlining certain un desirable areas of cities to lack indigenous people of color. These regions have degraded urban habitats that are disproportionately affected by pollution, climate change, and lower biodiversity. I got this definition from a really great article by Greenlining, which has done a lot of work in Pacoima, um, in the San Fernando Valley. Pacoima is kind of this like really unfortunate classic example of environmental racism where communities were redlined into these areas. There's tons of freeways that cause pollution and a lot of Pacoima is disproportionately affected by climate change and also lower biodiversity. And I'm talking about biodiversity a lot. So um, I think it's hard to talk, have di honest discussions about urban ecology without addressing environmental racism because there is a cost to racism, not only financially, but environmentally as well. But so why look at biodiversity, right, in the city? Uh, I've been asked this a few times before I've given this talk, and I, it's kind of a loaded question for me, so I want to address that. Like I kind of alluded to before, um, biodiversity can be an index for environmental of environmental racism. If we if lower um, communities of um, that have lower socioeconomic um, power, um, perhaps uh, less access to higher education, there's pretty strong correlation that they also have lower biodiversity as well. Or, or potentially this is something that needs more research, something that we can look into more. Looking at biodiversity also tells us about the ecosystem health of a region. You know, uh, things like such as pollution, climate change, uh, we're able to monitor looking at a species richness and biodiversity in an area. This is my favorite, disrupt stigma. So that loaded question of why look at biodiversity in a city, people kind of look at cities as like, oh, like forget about it. Like it's a lost cause. It's just all weeds and like just trash birds everywhere. Um, and that stigma needs to be exploded because that's absolutely not true. Wildlife's coming from the hills and establishing in the cities and it's here to stay. Finally, nature is beautiful. It doesn't need a justification to be studied. It just is. Uh, and I think beautiful things should be studied. Literature, art, and uh, ecology are some of those. So let's go into the methods of what I did, which I haven't really discussed all that much, but um, let's get into it. First, I wanna show you this like non-native chicory. 
and it's attracting a pollinator. This hoverfly, people typically don't think of hoverflies uh, or flies in general as pollinators. This one's really pretty, it's an eight of one. Um, calligraphy marginated um, hoverfly. I probably am butchering that. Really pretty, I just love this picture. Okay, so first what I did was I got on this app, iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a citizen science app that is networked with this huge community of experts that can go on it and see what you've posted. It's geotagged, it has a date. It's really cool. You take a picture and even, there's even an AI that can like try to identify the plant or animal or fungi that you're looking at. So I start with the food garden. I'm like, okay, I wanna look at iNaturalist observations just at the food garden. So I make a polygon at just the food garden. I make a you know, box with the shape sort of thing at the food garden. Most of the observations are me, because I kind of hang out there a lot, but there's also some from Stara, the, uh, the Institute of Sustainability, and Tara, a former uh, manager at the food garden. So I looked at that, I verified the observations. I was like, okay, these are observations. These organisms do exist there in space and time. They may not currently be there, but they've been there. So I'm gonna count them as observed. Then, I, and so those are previous species. And I made a polygon all around CSUN in some of the neighborhoods. And I was like, what are the potential species that are here? I threw out the kind of ridiculous like landscaping plants. Um, I went through the list and kind of um, looked what's reasonable, what's not reasonable. Anything that was planted, I disregarded as iNaturalist is typically things that are wild, be it weeds or native plants, or non-native or native plants. Things that like are there that did not just like someone decided it would be a good idea. I rejected wetland organisms. Uh, the food garden does not have a permanent water source. They have a hose. They have a lot of precipitation and water in the area, but that doesn't mean it's a wetland. So, and we have the duck pond at the orange grove. So I disregarded those species. Okay, next I went to the food garden for two days, 16 hours and approximately. And I observed every species that I could in that area. So this area, and I'll show later in a map, but it includes that fenced in food garden and then the educational space as well. Uh, fences don't do a phenomenal job of blocking organisms um, other than humans, maybe no, not even coyotes, they can easily jump over it. They just don't do a good job of blocking organisms. And so I, can, I consider that entire space uh, part of the food garden. And so I did a northeast to southwest sweep of the area. And this was really important um, to maintain spatial integrity throughout this uh, observational period. And anything wild that I saw, I put on iNaturalist. Even though I've recorded all the species, whether they're planted or non-planted, I only put wild things, non-planted things on iNaturalist. Some of my sources for how I identified these organisms were the Jepson Manual, second edition. This is a the flora of the entire state of California, non-native and native plants. I used iNaturalist community and the artificial intelligence. I used the website CalFlora, which is great for, again, non-native and native plants. I used CalIPSI to define what's an invasive species versus just a non-native species. So I'll talk a little more about that later. Use various organismal Facebook groups. Uh, shout out to Andrea Havakern Spider Group which is absolutely incredible for entomological facts and identifications. She's a former grad student in the bio department. And then I used the natural history of Orange County uh, UCI field guide. And so that's kind of a mouthful. If you don't know what that is, I highly, 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 highly recommend it. Just go to Google search. It is such a cool um, website. It has like every organ is almost every organism that exists in Orange County on that website. And I just nerd out. I use it maybe like every other day, I think, when I'm in LA County, Orange County. I just get frustrated even just thinking about it. It's just such a cool website. <laughs> I brag about it to everyone. Yeah. Uh, so then the next part of the what I did was pin drops. So this is a little confusing, but hang on. So I created a map of 10 randomly spatially distributed uh, uh, transects throughout the food garden. Each one of these transects was one meter long. That's, so a transect's like a line, right? That you can measure things on. 
every 30 centimeters on those transects, I measured every organism that hit that point. And so when you drop a pin, right, the pin creates an imaginary laser that goes up into space. So every single plant that hit that laser, all imaginary, I recorded. And the highest plant got the height. So I recorded the height of the highest plant. So that's 30 points, uh, 10 transects. It's not a lot. Um, but yeah, so I recorded that from a northeast to southwest direction, again, to maintain spatiality. So here's again what that kind of looked like. These were randomly distributed through Arc, um, ArcMap. Some of them got ended up being clustered, but they were one meter apart from each other. So I um, considered that fine. I didn't want to like further bias it by rejecting it and trying to more randomly distribute them. In hindsight, maybe we could have uh, just planned the distribution a little better and made it a little haphazard once we are on the ground. But I'm actually happy with this result. So these were the transects that I ended up analyzing. So what are the results? What did I find from spending two days and a bunch of hours looking at iNaturalist? Here's some fungi that I found. Uh, so there's a giant, I don't know how many of you have been to the food garden, but there's some pine trees in one area. There's a big black walnut in another. And so walnuts de heavily depend on fungi to give them nutrients through their roots. And so uh, there is, they have a, they prefer a, um, are vascular uh, mycorrhizae. So, and they penetrate the cells and the roots and they have these structures and they transfer nutrients back and forth and water and um, glucose and it's really fascinating. Um, I believe this is one of the types of fungus. I could be wrong. I'm not very good with mycology. I think it's a fascinating subject, but, but um, yeah, super cool. So the walnut tree has a lot of fungi associated with it. So what did I find? So um, I'm just gonna, I'll talk a little bit, but I'll give all of y'all a second to digest this. I found 195 species at the food garden, which <laughs> I just giggle thinking about because it's so much, it's like half an acre. Um, yeah, it's really cool. So uh, 138 of those were plants, um, some of the big numbers, 29 of those were insects. 14 of those were birds, and I saw two mammals, which is pretty cool. One mo uh, mollusk, or uh, you know, snail ally and stuff, or snails and stuff like that. Um, which I'm really excited to show you about. Um, yeah, three species of fungi, um, one millipede, which is in the, um, in the group Diplopodia, Diplopoda. Um, herps, no herps. I have seen an alligator there, lizard there in the past, but I didn't record it on iNaturalist, so I didn't include it into the observed. Um, looking back, maybe I should have. There is a population of alligator lizards there, but I did in end up including them in the potential, um, which leads me to the potential, right? Um, I, I think this list is way underestimating what's actually potentially there, and it includes a lot of mammals, and a lot of those are bats. Uh, there's a huge bat population in Los Angeles, and a lot of work has been done in downtown Los Angeles to study bat populations. So we know what species utilize urban spaces in Los Angeles, and so I included those in, um, in the potential species. Insects, again, way underestimating. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but I'll give you a second to just kind of digest this. It's super cool. So I'm going to talk about plants a lot. I'm a plant ecologist. That's kind of what I do. So I'll dip into some of the other groups too. But uh, so about, let's move this, about 32% of the plant species were non-planted and about 67.4% of the plants were planted by humans. Here's a good example of that. Here's amaranth, great to attract birds. But here in the background, you can see a lot of horseweed, which was a guarantee not planted. Um, yeah, it's a cool plant, non-native, cool. I believe this is Bonarensis, uh, might be mispronouncing that, but again, non-native. So here we have the percentage of non-native plants, 86% uh, and native plants, 13.8%. So native and non-native, native to California, uh, non-native, not native to California. 
Here's an example of a native plant. This is Areognum fasciculatum or California buckwheat. And here's a pollinator, the moth, uh, mint loving moth. Uh, in, it, it's in that family at least. I didn't, I don't know if I got it down to species. I might have. Um, it was one of the only one, members of that family that I found, or genus that I found. So super cool. Uh, California native plants can attract a lot of cool insects. So next, of the 138 observed plant species, 72 of, them, 72 of them were edible. And these aren't all ed, uh, planted plants. A lot of these are not planted. So that's kind of, that's a lot. Um, 19, per, uh, 19 of those individuals were, of, of the 138, were considered invasive by the California Invasive Plant Council. And three of them are considered rare by, the, uh, by Cal Flora in the California Native Plant Society. And just a little, clarifier with that they're not native they're not rare they are native they're not rare within landscaping they're commonly used in landscaping but they are the wild populations are rare. here's an example of an edible non-native invasive i'm sure some people are scratching their head when i said edible but it's definitely edible um plant i'm sure it fills up a few of the other categories i've mentioned this is a rhodium cicutarium or a stork beak fillery um, I, I think they're pretty. I don't know. I, I know a lot of people are probably like, what did he just say? It's a really rampant invasive in the state of California. And they're also in Nevada, so probably in a lot of places. Here's an example of a rare plant. This is a Tory pine. Again, super not rare in the landscaping industry. And I think that they may even be an invasive species in some countries, but they're native to California and they're rare in their native habitat and they can be found wild um, wild in uh, a few pr uh, preserves in San Diego, as well as in uh, the Channel Islands. But I think they're two different species. Next, we're going to talk about birds. So um, about 10% of the birds uh, that I found were um, fed on nectar. That's probably just the hummingbirds. About 20% fed on seeds. Again, 20% were omnivores. 26% were uh, fed on insects. And about, again, 20% fed on fruit. Here's an example of, this is, a, this is a mollusk, right? This is the slug, but it'd probably be lumped in with the insects. So that, the, a lot of this data has been um, with the help of an ornithologist from UCLA named Mars Walters. She's a graduate student. Uh, very, uh, very awesome, and they've they've helped me out a, a lot with this project. So shout out to them. Um, but a lot of this data was also com compelled by uh, Cornell. Uh, so yeah, not an insect, but definitely eaten as an insect. <laughs> and then also uh, nest bird nests. So uh, seven point seven percent of the birds use cavities. Uh, Forty six point two percent of the birds use trees. Fifteen point four percent use cliffs. And then about 31% I use trees or shrubs. And there was one I included in that says Phoebe, I think, that it will nest probably anywhere. Like they'll use other birds' nests. They'll use the same nest year after year. They'll nest on like structures and like, I don't know. So tree or shrub is kind of a loose category as well. Here's one bird that I found while I was working out there. That was a hooded oriole. Hooded orioles have been expanding in the range due to planting palm trees, which most of the time in California, our palm trees are not native. We have a one native palm tree, maybe two, if you want to throw a Mexican fan palm in there too. Um, the hooded oriole has been expanding in range into Northern California where it hasn't been before. Um, so that's kind of an interesting development, but it is native. So this is from the pin drops, and this is a lot to look at, but I really want you to just focus on the tallest things. I think they're the most interesting. So um, can I move me aside? The center, the middle finger, if you will, pointing at you, that's the Latuca seriola. That's um, prickly lettuce. That is the most common thing that I hit in my pin drops. Remember that laser that drops from space? Um, Lactuca cereal was by far the most common thing that I hit. After, th after that, we got things like Juglans nigra, which is um, the black walnut tree that is at the food garden. Um, Melvin neglecta, another common uh, non-native weed. And Soncus oleraceus, which is another 
common non-native weed. By the way, uh, three of the four, actually all four of these top plants are edible to some degree. Good luck trying to get at a walnut, though. They're a lot of work. But all these other things are really easy to eat. So I wanted to show you prickly lettuce. Um, it's here to the left, here in the center. There's also some malva in there as well, as well as some grasses, non-native grasses. Um, what's that like blurry kind of orange thing in the middle? That's a, uh, whoa, uh, that's a carpenter bee. That's a male carpenter bee. I was studying this area, it's full of non-natives, and all of a sudden I was being swarmed by male carpenter bees that were competing against each other, trying to um, attract the attention of a black female carpenter bee, valley carpenter bee. Um, they have like really strong scent glands. Um, they're, they're super sexually dimorphic, like the males are orange, the females are black, um, just super cool. All to probably to attract um, females, but also so they like do these like aerial battle shows. If they're black, they would probably attract um, get hit by a lot more sun and produce a lot more energy, um, heat, and they're also like battling at the same time, so they have this really high metabolism. If they're a lighter color, they can reflect more of the sunlight. So it, it's been theorized that this color difference is due to energy expenditure as well, which would be really interesting to look at um, different master's thesis. <laughs> and then I looked at uh, functional plant groups. So we have annual forbs. Uh, how do I make that go away? Maybe if I just don't do it. Yeah, we have annual forbs, annual grasses, trees, perennial forbs, perennial grasses, and shrubs. So annual versus perennial. Annual grows every year. Perennial can grow year after year. By far the most common thing. and I. I really love this is annual forbs. Um, yes, a lot of them are non-native, but I just, yeah, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in the discussion, but it's still annual forbs, like hundreds of years later, post colonization and it's still annual forbs that are dominating the landscape. Yeah. Uh, here's one of the perennial forbs. Uh, you could call it, it, it it's, I, I've seen it lumped into both categories. Uh, this is Solanum americanum. This is a native um, weedy kind of uh, relative of the tomato plant. Night, deadly nightshade is another name for it. I, yeah, I'm not going to infer anything about edibility with this plant. I just lumped it into non-edible, but I've heard varying accounts of that. Probably don't eat this plant or anything that looks like it. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, you can see up in the corner, I, th I think this is a plant seed. I, I didn't, I just noticed this in the photograph. There's also some bug, you know, egg cases that can kind of look like this. But I actually do think there's some egg, uh, there's some seeds that are stuck to the, sol uh, the hairs, the trichomes of this Solanum americanum, which I've um, just kind of like lends itself to the next generation. It's probably not going to be this plant. This plant could produces like little toma purple tomato things. But um, yeah, of what invasives could come or non-natives could come after. So from the pin drops, I've recorded the highest height, right? That laser, the tallest thing that hit the laser I recorded. If you kind of squint, and I'll talk about this more later, but this kind of looks like the entire food garden, right? You have the educational space on the left, you have the, the tallest things, which are the pine trees, and then you kind of have some of the black walnut, and you have the fruit trees and some of the crops as well. So I just love this graph because it paints this like 2D picture of what the food garden looks like if you were to just kind of flatten it out and look at it from a distance. Let's kind of go further into some of those uh, results as well. Discussion. Here we have a, oh, I always get this wrong, loquat. There's like kumquats and loquats. Kumquats, I think, are the citrusy yeah, kind of one. That's loquat. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, loquats. But this is edible to people. It's ubiquitous throughout um, Los Angeles. You can make jelly out of it. It's super delicious. Um, and they're, so they're important to people, which I think is really Im is, is critical to this conversation of maintaining uh, the human perspective in this, because this is a humanly driven, the human driven landscape. But a lot of um, insects use this, this plant as well. So I introduced this idea of potential species richness, which I'm sure is not novel in the ecological circles. 
So potential species that I observed in my polygon that I created on my naturalist plus observed species I saw with either my two eyes or other people have seen with their eyes on iNaturalist. And the number is 281 species. That is like <laughs> that is so big for an urban area. And I think it speaks a lot to the soil. Um, we have really rich soil at the food garden, tons of organic material from all the years that they did composting at. It is just super nutrient rich. There's a lot of water from artificial water um, that gets from all the way in Owens Valley and Mono, Mono Basin, all the way down the LA aquifer, straight to the food garden. And it's just a great, you know, like the plants and animals really love that amount of nutrient and water availability. So that's about one species per seven square meters or one tiny home, very tiny, tiny home. So you see those like Facebook things of tiny homes, like a very, a tinier version than that, seven meters. A species of like that, if you stacked all those together. Um, so yeah, so not as biodiverse as potentially like the Amazon rainforest, but it, it's pretty cool and so, something I'm not shake at. So a lot of the non-planted non plants were also non-native and they're also edible, not all of them. And please don't go like just picking weeds and like eating them and then suing me. So but it was a it was a quite a large number of them so it, it gives us like nuanced kind of way that we can look on um, non-native plants instead of being like oh throw them in the trash get rid of them of all spray them all with herbicide which I, not that i have a severe problem with herbicide there's a time and place for it but it gives this nuance that uh, this holistic way that we can view non-natives as um, potential food nutritious food sources especially for low-income communities and a lot of these plants i eat all the time especially while i'm working but, um you can throw in your salad or like a lot of these have ancient grains that can be delicious. A lot of the non-native plants are wind dispersed. It's a super popular way of um, dispersal, but not all of them. And some of them are bird dispersed as well, which is, um, in, it, it's important to talk about, you know, the, the different dispersal methods of how, how plants can end up, non-planted plants can end up at the food garden. Some of the invasives were planted um, I'll give you an example is the olive tree. Calypsi um, classifies olives as, non, uh, as an invasive species. They're not invasive everywhere in California, and I'm not, please don't go pulling out the olive tree because it's super amazing. It's something to think about though, right? So like we have a lot of human choice, right? I talked about that in the introduction, in what plants we plant in the food garden. And sometimes those are invasives that can degrade the quality of habitat for native species, for insects, they can degrade hum, um, human uh, economic, uh, eco the, you know, economic situations. They can um, create a problem for forestry or management. Um, sometimes they're toxic cattle. It just really depends on a species to species basis. Finally, uh, the natives, uh, most of the natives that I found at the food garden, not all of them, but a lot of them were planted. Again, human choice. And it has been shown in previous studies that natives species attract more insects and native species attract more birds, right? So not only the seeds um, from the plants, but also the fact that there's more insects now allows for more bird diversity as well. So a great way to increase biodiversity in an area is to increase the amount of native species that you have as well. These insects and birds evolved with these plants and so they're best suited for that, re um, that region, typically. Though humans can change a lot. So again, situation by situation basis. So we found a lot of variability in the bird diet. Diet, I think hummingbirds are maybe the exception. They kind of, a lot of them eat nectar, but they also are insectivores as well, which surprises a lot of people. So a lot of variability in diet. 60% of the birds could disperse seeds. So I'm including omnivores in that as well, and, and seed eaters as well, if they're sloppy with how they're eating seeds. So that's a lot, and bird, some bird species can distribute seeds about 300 kilometers. So that's pretty far. I, I don't think that's a bad thing or a good thing, it just is. It, it depends on the situation you're talking about. If they're distributing invasive species, it's probably not great, but that's just our opinion as humans as well. About 50% of them, of the birds, um, were eating insects. You know, I'm including omnivores in there. The crows and ravens are probably eating large grasshoppers and stuff like that. Maybe other smaller things. 
And that's important, right? So the more diverse plants that we plant, a lot of natives that we plant, they can increase biodiversity for insects. And this is potentially really important for bird diversity as well. So you might not like insects, but birds certainly do. I like insects, I think they're really cool. Also trees and shrubs are really important. Most of the nesting habit, if we want birds nesting at season, which they are, um, if we want more birds to be nesting at season, trees and shrubs are really important. I know we love grassy lawns, but there's only a few species that those birds, uh, the only a few species of birds that those sorts of grassy habitats actually help things like killdeer. Um, and then a lot of times their eggs get squished in them. So having habitat heterogeneity, right? Different types of habitat is really important. So from the pin chops, like I said, prickly lettuce, Lactuca seriola was the most common species. Um, it, it's cool, it's edible. Um, it has supposed medicinal qualities to it. Again, please don't go plicking plants and telling them Richard told you it's okay. Uh, no surprise, it's wind dispersed. It's you know rampant throughout California. It's a really common plant. I, I find it near my apartment near CSUN all the time. Uh, you can tell it by because it has like spikes on the ridges. If you look on my Instagram, it's the first post that I have right now from Sparks Nevada. So it's here too. Um, yeah, and so most of the landscape is annual forbs. And like I said before, I think I just think it's really cool that like previously before white white colonization, we had mostly annual forbs in the San Fernando Valley. We kind of still do have mostly annual forbs in the San Fernando Valley. A lot of these species, annual forbs, grow um, in disturbed soil conditions, in clay conditions, poor soil, you know, right? Um, heavily disturbed. A lot of them are ruderals. Not all California native annual forbs are ruderals. Um, some of them are. I, I just find it really cool that even though a lot of them are non-native and they're ruderals, they're still persisting here. So that kind of functional group is still maintaining itself within the food garden. And again, that 2D uh, graph that I showed you, that if you kind of like squish the food garden, it like shows what the food garden looks like. And I loved that. So let's push that a little further though. What's a 3D map of the food garden look like? So any of the geography people in here are gonna cringe when they see this, but so I made an uh, inter uh, 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 interpolation of the food garden uh, using my uh, transects. So the dark, dark dark green are the highest points in the food garden and the dark dark purple are like some of the lowest points in the food garden it's not a great model but I, it amuses me i think it does a pretty good job like it definitely shows the pine trees it definitely shows part of where the walnut the walnut is here what it doesn't show is a lot of the fruit trees and uh, olive trees that are along here um, and but it, it does a really good job in the educational space that, that's about right. It shows a lot of the bare ground, these um, dark purple areas um, being bare ground. So I think if we had more transects, we could potentially get a better model out of this. So conclusions, right? Wrapping up. Here's that crustacean I promised you. So wood louse. Uh, Woodlice or roly polies, or you probably maybe you have a different name for them. They're non native crustaceans. I've, <laughs> these don't go eating them, but I've heard they taste like shrimp. Uh, um, they actually brought a, when woodlice came here from Europe, they actually brought a predator with them too. It's this spider called the woodlouse spider, and it has this huge cholesterol, huge fangs, and they're, they're kind of harmless. They're super nice spiders. But they have these big things so they can break open the carapace of this uh, this crustacean and get into it all, all that awesome shrimp-like meat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let, let, let's talk about some like bigger themes here, right? So there's benefits of natives, and I've talked about that. Increase natives in an area, and you increase the native the the insects, and you also increase the bird diversity. But there's also benefits in an urban setting to non-native plants as well. I wouldn't go saying that in wildlands you should be spreading non-native plants, but maybe just tolerating non-native plants in urban settings could benefit specifically low-income communities where these plants are, a lot of them are edible to some degree and very nutritious in garden settings where they're not accumulating toxins or 
harvesting chemicals from like say is like a, a prickly lettuce that's growing off the side of the sidewalk could be. So I, I think a little bit of nuance, a little bit of a holistic approach to non-natives for humans is a good is a good way to go. Um, like I said, increasing native plants would increase insect and bird diversity. Um, when it comes to native plants as well, uh, I talked a little bit about this with Nat as well. When looking at potential native plants, I, I think edibility to humans is really important, right? We still want to serve these underrepresented communities. We still want to serve low income communities, but we also want to increase biodiversity. I think one way to do both is by having edible native plants. There's a um, botanist and horticulturalist at Samo Fund in the Santa Monica Mountains, Antonio Sanchez. Previously, he was the Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden. He has an article with the California Native Plant Society where he talks about this. And if anyone's as interested, I can send them that. He's an expert and he talks a lot about native plants that are edible. And I, I think that's really important that we, we stay in touch you know, with native plants. So we have some sort of cultural identity around living in Los Angeles and that it still be centered around humans. Cause I, I think we, we don't wanna like disregard our low income communities as well. Um, heterogeneity to biodiversity is really important. Different types of habitat structure. So bare ground, rocks, shrubs, holes, trees, are really important to maintaining biodiversity as well. Uh, citizen science, like I talked about before, you get students like me, grad students, involved in um, research like this, um, using citizen science, using apps like iNaturalist, CalFlora, Seek, things like, like that. Uh, bird, there's a birding one too, eBird, which is really popular. It increases biodiversity knowledge of a given area if you're able to report observations. It's really cheap and it's a huge networking tool is there's a ton of experts all around the state that are constantly helping with identifications. Uh, just kind of wrap up, CSUN is very privileged. We are surrounded by single family homes that are well irrigated, have great soil, um, or soil, you know, they have a ton of organic matter in the soil. And a lot of the biodiversity is an effect of that. At least that's what I hypothesize. Um, I don't think other urban gardens would show the same amount of biodiversity uh, in the Los Angeles area. I could be wrong. And I think this could change, it could be a matter of size, how big the urban garden is and what the socioeconomic level of the community at large is. But I think continuing studies like this where we, or you know, observational periods like this where we look at ur urban gardens it could be an important index for environmental racism. And if I could get money and I could go further with this, that's what I would look like. I would look at bio, I would involve students and I would look at urban biodiversity at other food gardens at other college campuses and community colleges, uh, elementary schools, middle schools and such. I think that could be really important for the greater community. I wanna end with this domesticated oat that I took a picture of at sunset. Uh, it's really pretty. It's a non-native, but I love it, and it's just kind of like glistening in the sun. Uh, thank you to the Institute of Sustainability, uh, my advisor, Dr. Polly Schiffman, Mars Walters of UCLA, the CSUN Biology Department for putting up with me, uh, the California Native <laughs> Plant Society, which I'm a student advisor for, uh, California Invasive Plant Council, and my sweet and patient boyfriend. Uh, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> ah, excellent. Beautiful. Yes, you should show pictures. Uh, so Richard, thank you so much. Uh, we've got a couple of questions and then I wanted to ask you some as well. And, and again, folks, uh, feel free to keep typing in some in the, in the chat. Um, we've got about uh, 12 this minutes. Yeah, so can you see the questions or no? No. Uh, okay, I'll read them to you. Uh, first first yeah, question. Can okay, you can remember about the uh, rhodium, I don't know how to say the, Cicutarium. Cicutarium. Uh You mentioned about the edible nature of it. Uh, someone had asked, uh, Paul had asked about recipes. <laughs> Wait, uh, was that Paula Schiffman? Yes. Oh, my advisor. Okay. Oh, he just thanked. <laughs> um, so I've, <laughs> Thanks for I've attending, of, Paula. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard of it being utilized in salads. Uh, <laughs> I've also heard of it being blanched. Uh, oh, there's a okay. uh, Bowder Pascal is one of the leading herbalists uh, and food gastronomists. I don't know how to say yeah. this. He, he's a forager in Los Angeles. Yes, right. If you haven't heard of 
Crowder, Pascal, please buy one of his books or something. Um, yeah. He's such a cool guy. I think he's wrong on his identification of Bromus Diandros and Bromus Tectorum. <laughs> I've kind of talked to him about this. Yeah. But um, he talks about Erodium Secretarium as well. Um, I don't know. It's probably not the most delicious weed you can eat. Uh, but it's definitely there. Yeah. <laughs> Good question, Paul. Thank you. Uh, someone had asked a question about, uh, of course, uh, when you brought up the roly polies, um, we all have different relationships with roly polies. Um, uh, someone asked if they harm, if they're you know basically uh, detrimental to urban ecosystems. Well, maybe we can talk about I, gophers too, well, since we that's another thing. After since that seems to be part of a. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so roly polies not, yeah. aren't from one. Uh, yeah, roly polies aren't from here, right? Yeah. Um, I, I'm right. not an anthropologist. From my perspective, they're decomposers. Uh, they eat a lot of like decaying plant matter. Yeah. So we've killed a lot of our native decomposers. We mm -hmm. used to have a lot more native earthworms in Southern California, and we've killed a lot of them out. There's only a few pockets in Southern California where a refugia for native earthworms. Mm -hmm. Do I think roly polies are bad? I don't know. I struggle with bad versus good, especially yeah, in discussions. Right. In ecology, right. yeah. they have a function. Yeah. Um, I think potentially harbor parasites as well that could be negative for human impacts. Mm. Again, I, I, I'm going to say I don't know enough about this subject, but I think that's a great question. And yeah. now I'm going to look yeah. at this. Yeah. But then, so maybe I'll jump on that. And, and as I, before we talk about gophers, I just wanted to point everyone to the, um, you should be able to, see, oh, I don't know if you could see all the, let me open this up because Helen had left. A bunch of information that for everybody to um, see. Hopefully, everyone can see this. I don't know. Maybe Helen, if you could send those again. I'm not sure if everyone uh, requests for seed victory garden seeds. We have a seed distribution program um, that and a survey. If you, if you all could um, fill that out. I don't know if Helen, you could send those again. Sorry about that. So maybe you talk a little bit really quick about because um, we talked about this before. But I think there's going to a lot of gardeners that are on this chat too. I mean, on yeah. this, um, about gophers, you know, and, and maybe other kinds of, I mean, you talk, yeah. I, like, I like the way you frame the, you know, uh, function versus good or bad. I think this is important. Right. For us. So Fada's pocket gopher is a yeah. uh, valley pocket gopher. It's yeah. really common in the San Fernando Valley. I've seen them myself right outside that high school that's on the other side of the food garden. Uh, so I included them in potential species as they fit within that polygon. Yeah. Um, they dig extensive burrows, right? And they have they they segregate different parts of their burrows for different reasons. They disturb soil. They throw seeds around. They bring seeds um, to their area. They eat roots and you know plant matter. They are ecosystem engineers. They can attract dozens of species, probably way more than that, species to their burrows. I think they found with um, with prairie dogs uh, in the family of Scoridae that they were able to attract over 100 species of organisms to their um, towns, their prey dog towns. So bodice pocket gopher on the same level of that, I believe strongly, um, it, it's an important symbol of the, uh, the San Fernando Valley. They attract animals to their burrows and the animals utilize those burrows. And, you know, bodice pocket gophers get eaten by barn owls and they get eaten by red, red hawks. They're just a part of this ecosystem. And, you know, you get one of your plants eaten by a pocket gopher, so what, go buy another one. Like, stop trying to poison wildlife to justify, like, your perfect garden. Um, I, I don't really have much sympathy for people that use poison <laughs> on uh, animals uh, because it just gets entrenched into the food web, uh, such as protophagum. Or, um, and maybe on islands is a little different of a scenario, but when you're on the mainland and we got birds of prey and stuff and mountain lions and coyotes, like, just cut it out with poisons, really. <laughs> so that... That actually is a kind of a related, well, a little bit of a different, maybe this might be the last question because this is, has a probably uh, a nuanced or import, you know, kind of long answer. Uh, someone had asked, how would you say that knowledge about urban ecology and biodiversity should drive action? And you talked a little bit about this, but maybe um, by way of kind of concluding and also this could probably get into your personal story, how you you know, because I, I wanted to ask how you got first got interested in thinking about urban ecology. So maybe those are kind of as a two-part question for you. 
Yeah. So I guess I could talk about my own experience as a um, as a kind of low income queer man within the San Fernando Valley. Um, so I have I I worked my way through community college as a dog groomer and through college doing various jobs and as an assistant uh, working for a, gen a geneticist on campus and um, just kind of surrounded in this urban space can feel really overwhelming um, especially not having a lot of money for fresh fruits and vegetables so you try to kind of connect to green spaces where you can you try to connect to um, free food <laughs> wherever you can and you know, so that attachment to these green spaces, to that sense of wanting to just breathe in a space that it can, the anxiety can kind of limit that, right? We all just want a breath of fresh air and we all just want food in our stomachs. So that's kind of my journey with urban ecology. I've also um, been fascinated with animals and plants since I was a little kid. And I gardened a lot when I was a kid as well, like corn and tomatoes and stuff. Um, so what can people do? So I, I talked about this in my Instagram takeover event where urban forestry, right? What forest, Los Angeles, it was supposed to be a grassland or, or a four blend of just annual form. We can never get back to that point ever again. We can't just have poppies, California poppies, as far as the eye can see and red maids and grizzly bears. We will never get to that point. It's, it's gone. What we can do is make the best of a bad situation, and we can help heal low-income communities and hurt communities to a degree, not all the way. There's no silver bullets, right? But we can like do our best to help those communities by planting. One thing we could do is habitat restoration in these degraded areas, creating green spaces of native plants. Also, planting trees and keeping those trees alive. So we were talking about earlier collaborations with tree people. That's something they're doing. They're going to the Pacoima and to these low-income communities, and they're planting native trees and trees that will tolerate living in cities. Some of them are non-native, but and they're helping them. They're they're watering them and keeping them alive, right? And then these trees will provide shade and they'll help with the issues involving climate change and decreases in um, localized pollution, right? As well, that's something we can do on a social justice level. We can help he, uh, help these communities. We can also amplify voices, right? Like Green, Green Lining is a, a organization primarily of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. We can amplify organizations like that and and spread their message, not mutating it, but just allowing them to speak for themselves, right? I, I think all too often science is filled with white men, um, and we can allow you know people of color, especially scientists, to um, speak their truth and speak their message as well. I, I think queer people have been, you know, subjugated a lot in STEM, but that's quickly changing. And so I, I, as a white person myself, I try to use my, my privilege to amplify voices as much as possible. And I think we can all do that better, uh, no matter what race we are. That's, that's perfect. Wonderfully said, uh, Rich, Richard. And um, I think what you're doing and your, what your work is, is so important. And, and I, I know that we'll be, we'll continue to collaborate. And I love that project you you had highlighted which talks which touches on this this idea of comparing uh urban diver biodiversity in um you know other other community gardens other urban farms other campus gardens throughout la i think in other neighborhoods and other communities um you know i think identification is one of these great tools to find things hidden in plain sight and then you kind of use the community knowledge and the community resiliency to to activate those spaces and to use them as um, food production sites, perhaps, or you know whatever the whatever the community needs are, but it, biodiversity could, can can um, uh, it's not simply preserve and and wall off, but it's actually about creating these new relationships or building on these older relationships and just recognizing them. So, um, so with that, Richard, thank you. Nice, oh, nice ending there. That nice picture right, right there. Um, what is that? Um, yeah, stink bug, green stink, stink bug. Yeah, yes, Southern yeah. green stink bug. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And Richard, thanks for free time and have a great uh, research trip. We'll have you come back and maybe you could talk about what you did up in Atlanta next time we have you out. At, at, yeah, that's at, on, on the webinar. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. See you all soon. Bye bye.